going to talk about transfer pricing, and this is a major area. We'll start tonight, and then we'll uh, we'll go over a little bit. I think uh, at the uh, at the next session next week. Hopefully, the weather will have cleared enough by then that we do not have another uh, uh, another problem. You received an email from me about viewing several, uh, viewing three videos. Uh, the three videos are actually the third, fourth, and fifth uh, of the coverage which I had hoped to do for you know, over two class sessions. What uh, I will do tonight and, and some of uh, next time, I think, is attempt to go over the first two sections. In other words, we'll talk uh, a bit about uh, what I'll call the macro view and some basic concepts tonight and early next week. And uh, I had asked you to do three, four, and five, which uh, covers these, you know, some of these other areas, uh, and then we can talk about those areas uh, as well uh, after you've watch the, uh, the podcasts, uh, watch the, uh, the videos for those. Uh, and again, I, in my email to you, I reminded you that these were from uh, a few years previously before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And uh, therefore, I refer to maybe occasionally to deferral, uh, but the basic uh, Transfer pricing issues, for the most part, are the same, and we'll we'll cover uh, uh, where there has been uh, some developments of late uh, separately. Now, let's start by uh, talking about transfer pricing by asking the question, which is, uh, what uh, what sort of situation do we see? Uh, let's say this is the U.S. Uh, let's say the U.S. comes like this, and we have X, Y, and Z. We know that today, and certainly many years previously, corporations operate in groups. They will have a subsidiary here, they will have a subsidiary there, they will have a subsidiary in a third place. Now. These companies have transactions with each other. Now, I think you may recall uh, that at least once before, you know, I've pulled money out of this pocket and then put it up in this pocket. And as far as I'm concerned, nothing happened. But if this pocket is one legal entity, and this pocket is another legal entity. Something has happened legally. There's been some sort of transaction or event which justified taking the money out of this pocket and putting it up here. Now, what are some examples of some of these transactions or events? Okay, so you're saying a product sale. Yeah. Okay, so maybe uh, maybe Z over here is manufacturing. Uh, this is uh, U.S. here. Maybe Z is manufacturing a product and selling that product to Y, and maybe Y uh, within its country of incorporation uh, makes sales to customers. Uh, okay, so uh, Z is making sales to Y, and then Y is reselling to customers in, in its country. Because the whole, you know, both Y and Z are owned by X. You know, X is like me. It doesn't care whether the money's here or the money's down here. But the U.S., because Z is a U.S. taxpayer, Country B, where Y is, uh, is uh, looking at Y as being a country B taxpayer. The two countries are very concerned 
about that price at which sales are being made. Because that price defines how much net income will be in Z, how much net income will be in Y. Maybe on a combined basis, the total group earnings are 100. But should it be 60 in Z and 40 in Y? Or should it be 50-50? Or should it be 20 in Z and 80 in Y? What should it be? It makes a big difference to the country's concern. Can they negotiate the percentage? Pardon? Say again. Can they negotiate the percentage? Ah, good, uh, good question. If you said negotiate, who is they? This two, this two parties. Ah, yeah. good question. You know, whenever we talk about a factual situation. You know, there's a, an almost infinite spectrum from here to here on what the facts might be. So for simplicity, let's first assume way at the right and then for simplicity, way at the left, but you know, not in the center where it gets really fuzzy. Okay, let's say that uh, Y and uh, Z uh, are pretty much run by people from X. And the people from X are defining, you know, what's going on. And that the employees of Y and X are compensated based, you know, to the extent they have uh, salary and bonus. The bonuses are based on the profits of the whole group as opposed to the profits of their subsidiary. Yeah. Okay, so that's one end of the extreme. At the other end, you've got a situation where, at, where Y and Z really have their own operationally independent managements. And in that case, where not only are they independent, but maybe they have bonus pools which are only the income within their particular company. Now, they have a personal incentive to increase as much as possible their own income. And they're not concerned about what income the other one has or doesn't have. Now, in that case, yeah, there might be some real negotiations. Now, does the tax law you know, take this into account? Uh, not really. Well, look guilty a little bit. You're right that if Y is a CFC, then it would be in this case. Yes, guilty might bring some money back for taxation, but which comes first? Intercompany pricing under these Section 482 transfer pricing rules or guilty? Which comes first? 482, yeah. Why? because you have to figure out what the right amount of income is in the CFC before you can apply subpart F income, before you can apply guilty. Yes, it may happen that there's real negotiations between the two, but irrespective of that, the IRS can still look at this and uh, decide you know, uh, whether they want to make an adjustment because too much is one place or too little. Now, if there is real negotiation, then the chances of the IRS finding a, a, a need for an adjustment is going to be probably much lower because what they negotiate probably will be an answer which ends up, in a sense, at an acceptable level from the IRS rules perspective. But there's no guarantee of that. Yeah, I mean, just as a, an example, I can remember a situation uh, with, again, a major multinational with uh, significantly different uh, service lines and businesses, and where, uh, in essence, uh, why, for example, was bidding on a major contract, 
very major contract. And Z over there is a subcontractor to a competing bidder. Now, you don't find this very often, but you do find it sometimes. More often today, of course, there's pretty tight central management, but there are, uh, there are uh, exceptions. Uh, to get back to the bigger picture, okay, what are some of the transactions? We've talked about sales. Okay, what about services? Maybe Y is performing services for Z. Well, how much should they be compensated for those services? Maybe Z is renting property, uh, you know, tables and chairs, is renting equipment to Y. How much should the rental be? But isn't that removed from the guiltier subpart F, the inner rental stuff? This is, this is all before you apply subpart F and guilty. All before. I know, but even if you have that deduction of that rental income under subpart F, it'll pull it back in, won't it? Well, it might. Yeah. But it might. There's exceptions for rental and an active trader business, but again, even though, and in, in fact, uh, somewhere in the slide deck I have uh, the issue, or let's say the question of, you know, are subpart F and guilty backstops to transfer pricing? In other words, if the, if the transfer pricing is wrong, you know, does the income eventually get taxed in the United States? because of the subpart F or guilty rules? And the answer is, well, maybe, but only partially. And at the lower rate. And, right, exactly. So the long and short is because the 482 transfer pricing rules are applied before subpart F and guilty, you have to ignore, in terms of your analysis, what potentially could happen under subpart F. Now, yes, as a in, in the real world, you might be sitting with a client and you might say, because of the nature of what is here and uh, whatever, you know, if we are aggressive on transfer pricing, you know, because of the nature of what you're doing and the amount of profit and the low amount of fixed assets you have, so you have very low Q by under the guilty rules, uh, you know, most of it's going to be recaptured and the amount you're benefiting is only this much. And therefore, do you really want to take this much risk on transfer pricing, uh, you know, being aggressive? Maybe you don't want to. That's part of your discussion in the real world, no question. But in terms of our analysis as to how we go about this, we have to start with the transfer pricing. Another thing, of course, is that maybe uh, Z loans money to Y. Maybe Z owns, uh, loans money. So what should the interest rate be? What's a, you know, what should the interest rate be? So these are all things that are covered by the transfer pricing. Now there's one other thing which, uh, which has become very, very, very important, which is covered uh, in one of the three videos that I asked you to uh, look at, and we'll uh, probably say a few more words about that next week, and that's the cost sharing agreement. Cost sharing agreement. We'll talk more about that later because that's, for a lot of you uh, on your project, that's going to be an important issue. Okay, now, uh, I've drawn this with X being a U.S. corporation. Does X have to be a corporation? Could X be an individual? Well, it says any two or more organizations. Okay, well, read, uh, read the applicable part. Which one's the applicable part? Well, 482 is only one paragraph yeah. long, so it has me worried that you're asking which is the applicable part. Well, it's one part. giant paragraph. <laughs> well, not, not, I wouldn't call it giant. Uh, In any case, two or more Okay, does it say what the nature of the taxpayer is? 
Does organization, uh, uh, you know, our trade or business imply whether we're talking about a corporation or an individual or an estate or a trust or? Whether or not incorporated. Whether or, whether not, or not. Organized uh -huh. in the U.S. And whether oh. or not affiliated. Okay, so whether or not incorporated and uh, what was that again? Whether or not organized in the U.S., whether or not affiliated. In terms of the question, the question was what about X? Does X have to be a corporation or could X be an individual? Neil? Could be anything. Could be anything, yeah. Could be you. Okay, and as a result, uh, X up there could be an individual. Does that individual have to be a U.S. individual? Well, in the picture, the picture is U.S., but let's, let's redraw the picture. You know, whenever you're getting the wrong answer from a picture, you should redraw it. Okay, so now uh, we will draw this line here and make this, we said this was country B. So let's make this one country A. Is that covered by these transfer pricing rules? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. The, they're drawn very broadly and focused on control. I have a question. So, so it X can be country, country A, and it has to be U.S., but they must have a connection with U.S. Well, well what's the... Uh, the connection, uh, the connection is not based on country of incorporation. The connection is based on whether the pricing of a transaction makes any difference. Okay, so let's give an example where the U.S. is not a place of incorporation for any of the companies. So let's now change this from the U.S. to uh, country C. But let's say that Z over here has a, a branch uh, in Seattle. Say that X has a branch in Seattle. And that branch causes effectively connected income. You remember that term from T515? Mm -hmm. That's encouraging. <laughs> not supposed to laugh. This is a serious matter. You've got to retain at least one or two things. Okay. I'm proud. So <laughs> the point is that none of these companies are formed in the United States, but one of them happens to be a U.S. taxpayer with respect to certain of its activities. Now, if a 482 adjustment affects that calculation of, infect, of effectively connected income, it uh, 482 applies. So, well, let, okay.